Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Adventures in Machine Learning. I'm Michael Burke, and I'm a resident solutions architect at Databricks, and I'm joined by my co-host. Ben Wilson. Uh, I wrote code for open source projects at Databricks. Nice. And today we have two guests. They both work at Databricks, and I'm absolutely ecstatic to talk to them. Um, they have really interesting backgrounds. And uh, so I'll do a quick intro, and then it'd be great if they can elaborate as well. Ankit Mathur studied at Berkeley and Stanford, and during his summers, he interned at both Facebook and Apple. And currently, he's a software engineer at Databricks, where he builds ML infrastructure. And then Su Ann Hong studied both at Caltech and CMU. And after getting her PhD, she worked at Facebook and now is a Databricks software engineer as well. So Ankit and Su Ann, what do you actually do at Databricks? Magic. <laughs> Lots of magic. I've seen your code. I know. We, we manage Kubernetes for you. <laughs> That's, That's true. Basically, what we do. <laughs> I mean, to sum it up, I think we basically just uh, build different. We've been building this model serving feature for a long time, um, and so there's a lot of different things related to that that we work on. Um, Sue Ann has been working a lot on the API side. Um, I've, I've kind of been working on uh, a bunch of different things, so it, it's been pretty fun overall in the last couple of years. So I'm really interested to hear the story from both of you about the genesis of this product over the years. So going back in time to early days of ML flow, <laughs> uh, we had this thing called serving V1, which was a, a product that up until relatively recently was still being pretty actively used and now sort of telling people like, Hey, could you stop using this? Like we want this to kind of go away, but how did, it, how did the scale and complexity of what that product was back then transform from, the, from that to what we're going to talk about today? And what was that process like to, to organically watch something get more and more complex and bigger? Yeah. Uh, you know, actually let me answer the first part first, because uh, you asked about the history of this product, right? Model serving. It actually goes back way back. I think the first instance I know is in 2015 at the Spark Summit. We had a demo on model serving. I think Ali gave it. Um, you know, it was it was impressive, but you know, we didn't actually build it right back then. <laughs> um, and then, you know, over the years, like we've definitely talked about it a lot because it's difficult for people to do on their own. Um, and then this V1, which is built on top of Spark clusters, but it's just a single node Spark cluster, um, really came about as, at that time, a proof of concept. You know, will people use this feature and, you know, how actively will they use it before we invest a lot of resources to make it scalable? Because it's a really hard problem engineering wise. So that's how I started, but, you know, it had a lot of traction. We have many, many customers using it. Uh, so then I think maybe two or three years ago, we decided, you know, we really need to build a scalable version of this. Um, and then we, yeah, I had to do a bunch of work, which I guess was the second part of your question. Um, maybe Anke can answer. He built a lot of it. <laughs> He's like our star engineer, <laughs> just to make it clear. Uh, well, okay. Um, I, I think that it was, it wasn't it like a hackathon project or something initially? V1, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so like it, it was just like, hey, we have this thing in the model registry. Could we just like serve that with one click? And I think that's where the one click part of it came about. And I honestly think that's why people like started using it so much is because it was so easy to use and it just launched directly into a cluster. Right. And I think that was also the kind of driving thesis behind the rest of what we built out, which was like, it's almost a different engineering problem to build this like massively scalable version of model serving. Um, there's a lot of basically not model serving related things that you have to do to even get there. Like we honestly have been doing a lot of not model serving or not ML specific things for many years because you have to build like scalable real-time infrastructure. Um, but I think like the ease of use aspect is like always been kind of the guiding product principle. So yeah, I mean, I think I remember like two and a half, two years ago almost, like we, we evaluated a bunch of different architectures. Should we go with a Kubernetes based thing? Should we go with something else? Um, and I think ultimately we kind of just decided to go with what, with um, this like Kubernetes based uh, approach of 
launching something and, and we had a, an idea in mind around other technologies within Kubernetes we could use to scale it out. Um, you know, and then we, we immediately ran into like the wall of problems in, uh, in the world of building distributed infrastructure. So we spent a lot of time just building that. Um, I don't know what, what, Suyan, what do you think was like the worst, mo most like unfortunate thing that we came across when we started doing the design? Um, during the design, I don't know, but I think, um, like the team didn't expect to have to write so many configurations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I I, for it. me, it was like yeah. when we got into the weeds of making a Kubernetes cluster, like there's so much subtlety to, and there's so many ways you can mess up. Like the, every mm -hmm. day or every week, we kind of found a new way to mess up the clusters. And like, sometimes people would just be like, yeah, this is like pretty bad. I think you just got to destroy this one and make a new one. Um, <laughs> So that, that was a surprise to me, at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think another aspect is we spent a lot of time on security, right? Making sure everything is isolated, all the workloads are isolated, um, networking is secure in every way. Right? So there was a lot of work that had to be done there that I think I didn't really think about in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, the product didn't really do a gradual change from V1 to V2. It was right. a quantum leap in mm -hmm. in a, going after what V1 taught everybody about people's usage patterns. It, just as you said, Ankit, I remember being on the opposite side of it and working with customers at the time. And people were like, hang on, we have this, this super easy way to just create an endpoint to serve this model. This is incredibly awesome particularly it's like smaller teams that had that were very agile on the ml development side so they could get a model out there quickly but a team like that where there's few data scientists maybe one or two ml engineers if they're like hey we need to service a hundred thousand requests a minute and how do we do that how do we build that infrastructure they're going to say we can't we have to either hire somebody to do it or this project's going to take years to build so with the one click and the fact that it was on Databricks, a lot of people assumed, hey, this will support, you know, infinite load. And then people quickly realized, like, oh, yeah, it's not really built for that level. But it, it's interesting to hear you say that's what its purpose was, was to sort of get people, you know, to gauge like how, it, how exciting is this for people. And then you take a step back and say, okay, we need to build this for real. And I'm most interested to hear about that, that concept, what both of you just said about, we approached it thinking that we were focusing on model serving because you work in ML engineering at Databricks. And a lot of people have that perception about the group is like, oh, you guys work on ML all the time. It's like, no, it's like pure <laughs> software engineering, like infrastructure stuff. Um, but how big of a a pie was that that you had to eat? Like, hey, we need to research how this stuff works and how long did that take? Well, we've got a really talented group. So I feel like that made it a lot easier, right? Like the, everyone on the team is like, you know, top to bottom. Like a lot of people have machine learning experience. Like my, my background was in machine learning infrastructure, training and serving models um, in like very specialized ways. But, um, you know, when you come and work on real problems, sometimes you have to just be like, okay, well, I have to go learn about network policies uh, so that I can build secure infrastructure. Uh, and I think, like, it's more a credit to, like, the entire team that people just kind of, like, rolled up their sleeves and did all the work. And now I think we're finally getting to the point where we can build really cool ML-specific stuff on top of it. Like what? Um, well, like, uh, you know, for example, we're, we're thinking a lot, I'm thinking a lot about, like, accelerators and how we can, like, you know, run really large deep learning models very quickly. Um, so that's a pretty ML specific thing. But the cool thing is it's built on like all of this work for, you know, scalable infrastructure. So, you know, you can get to like massive scale if you do the right things on, at that layer, but you have to start with the basic stuff, I guess. Yeah. And, and model serving automatically scales up or down to meet demand. Uh, so what were some considerations when developing that feature? 
I think, uh, I mean, the scale up and down, right? The, there are many benefits of it, but yeah, you know, one, I think probably on top of customers' minds is cost. So if you're not using it, you don't want to pay for it. So, you know, the more elastic it is, like more cost efficient for people. Um, and also, you know, it just gives us better capacity of you know, just like resources in the cloud. I think we have a really unique opportunity being a provider across customers, right? Like an individual customer who's evaluating, you know, running their own Kubernetes cluster and stuff like that. The cost considerations become really awful as soon as you're like, oh, well, how do I trade off availability and like quick auto scaling with paying for warm pools all the time? Um, so it's like hard to do that unless you're serving a bunch of different people. So I think that was a the that's the main opportunity that we're kind of taking advantage of. It's sort of environmental scalability with respect to industry as like a SaaS provider saying, we're going to take this human capital of the fantastic people on the team and at Databricks Engineering in general saying, we're going to put all of our minds together to solve this for tens of thousands of customers, hundreds of thousands of people that need to do this. So we'll, we'll eat that. We'll, we'll figure that out for you so that you don't have to. And I've noticed talking to even particularly bigger companies that they don't specialize in computer software. They specialize in banking or in selling goods to people or, you know, making sure that people's uh, doctor's appointments are scheduled properly. You know, all these different industries, their main focus is not on getting Kubernetes to run properly and scalable and support these use cases. Their use case is solving their problems. They do it with software and the engineering teams, but really they shouldn't have to worry about like, how do I do the most efficient you know, cost optimization for serving in an elastic environment? And what do I do when a, a pod goes into panic mode? How do I safely restart that? Like, What happens when the service goes down? Uh, how do I do code deployments? How do I validate that? You know, my CI checks for integration tests before I do a, de a rollout deployment of a new version of something. How do I handle all of that? All that infrastructure, that's all human capital spend at a company where you're, you're, I mean, it took years to build that here at Databricks properly to really build that system out. You know, and so a, a company that doesn't specialize in that, is that really worth their time? That's a real big question. I mean, it's like an extension of the story of the cloud in the last 10, 15 years, right? Like, what did the cloud do? It came and, like, said, you don't need to build a data center to build a scalable data science, like data platform and things like that, right? To have a compute platform, you don't need to build that yourself. We're, we're just saying the same thing, going a little bit further and saying, like, you focus on business value that differentiates you from your competitors, and we focus on the problems that everyone's going to have. That also brings a certain level of complexity that I don't think a lot of people appreciate who don't have to do this when they're writing software is designing for the common use case. So if, if we were to do a thought experiment for both of you, where if you were to take one particular use case, like, Hey, I need image classification at scale. Say we work for a company that people are just taking pictures on their phones and we want to be able to auto tag those, but we have an installed user base of 800 million users. So if you're going to build a system that could support that scalability using you know, some modern deep learning architecture, would the design considerations be easier to do that for that use case? Or if you were going to be building something that's generalized to support any use case? So man is the API guru, so I think she. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that's it, it, not just the API, right? But um, I think to support, for example, that use case well, it would be easier if you only had to do that, mm -hmm. right? Um, but now no, we're more like uh, support everything like pretty well, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, yeah. But I think, you know, there are use cases coming up that are just so popular that, you know, we will, we try to support them more, like, uh, better, like Ankiset, right? 
the LLMs are so mm-hmm. popular. Um, and I guess I can talk about it, but like uh, kind of a funny story is when we went ungated public preview with model serving, um, just suddenly, like we started seeing like much larger models being served because I think what happened was everyone saw this new menu item serving in Databricks and then they clicked on it and they're like, oh, let me try serving a hugging face model, right? Like some transformer. <laughs> so you know, it was just like a, actually a very different distribution than what we had seen like going through a really long period of private preview, uh, like talking about specific use cases. But I think you know, it just speaks to how popular these models are becoming, which is why you know, like for example, Ankit is spending quite a bit of time making sure they're supported well. Uh, I don't know if that answered your question or not, but yeah. Maybe I used a, a poor example there because that is like a complex use case for like, hey, those models are huge and you have to make design mm-hmm. considerations. But if that if that use case had been, hey, we just want to support uh like SK learn linear regression models. That's all our use case is. You'd have design considerations there where you're like, well, these things are like kilobytes in size and mm-hmm. we don't need to, you know, provision a bunch of memory that a pod can have access to, you know, CPU is actually probably more than enough to support the the workload there. But then, you know, if you have to support CPU and GPU and auto scaling, you know, memory allocation, uh, that that's a generalist sort of support framework that makes everything more complex, at least I think. At least the design mm-hmm. review process is much more complicated. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Because actually, when I was at Facebook, I worked on a like particular product. It was like an ad targeting product where we had our own ML platform, essentially, right? Like we, we had to build it because that was a long time ago. And like even Facebook didn't have a generalized infrastructure for machine learning. Um, yeah. And we're like, we were serving like millions of models, but they were all tiny. So we just had them as like rows in a SQL database, <laughs> you know, loaded them into memory on like a bunch of model servers. Like that's very different from what we have to do. Yep. Yeah. And it's interesting that you mentioned that Facebook hasn't completely solved this problem, or at least while you were there. Um, what are some of the sort of competitors to Databricks model serving? Are we the best in your guys' opinion or do we have weaknesses? What are the competitors? I would say like there's a whole host of competitors. I think there's like two companies made every week that are focused <laughs> on model deployment these days. Um, so, you know, obviously the biggest competitors are like SageMaker, um, Azure, um, GCP, Vertex, right? Like um, I would say all pro- products have strengths and weaknesses. I would like to think ours is the best. I don't know, Sian, what do you think? I think ours is the nicest to use. <laughs> I would agree. I mean, it's a popular space, right? Yeah. There's like all yeah. sorts of different stuff going on. Like machine learning is like really, really popular these days, uh, which means, which is like exciting for us, but also means that there's a ton of like new competitors that are coming up every day. Okay. I was hoping for a more controversial answer, but we'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> um. Cool. Um, another question that I had for Suan specifically, um, sort of diving into your prior experience, uh, this might be going back, but um, back in your college days, you worked on a couple of quote unquote cool art projects that use machine learning. Oh my God. What is this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If it's on the internet, it's fair game. So. Um, do you, do you still think about those things? And, and I was curious just what they are. Oh, that is a, uh... It's a long time ago. Um, I don't really think about them, I guess, but I think it would have been an interesting career path for me. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I, I, I did work on some art pieces that were based on machine learning. Um, I think that the one that was most fun, maybe, was um, we had this exhibition at, like, this was at CMU, actually, right? So in grad school and uh, it was at the children's museum of pittsburgh um and we built this installation that was called the curator so it was really just this like clear box you put the 
your art piece in. So, right, children come and they make little art drawings and they put it in there and it decides based on computer vision, like really like quote, quote, computer vision, because this is a long time ago, um, whether it's good art, whatever that means, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> and if it's good, it goes into this like nice box where you can see, see the content in there, like large, clear box. If it's not, it gets shredded. Wow. That comes up. <laughs> so you're just making kids cry the whole time. I should know, but they loved seeing it being be like shredded. That's the thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so it didn't quite work the way like you imagine, which was also interesting. But uh, um, I like there's a little bit of like a cheesy conceptual art piece to it, which is what is good art? It's like how, how do you even decide? Um, like in this case, we decided the algorithm would be you know, something that is like different from what this thing had seen over time was good as a novel. But yeah, conceptually, it was just like, you know, like who knows what good art is? It's kind of arbitrary. Yeah. So that was fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you're think- using stuff like OpenCV to do the matrix extraction of the image and then doing like locality distance measurements of how different yeah. is this compared to save state. That's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah that, that sums it up. I, I think, you know, if we were to do this now, right, we would have much more powerful tools to, to do stuff, but maybe it also would not be so cool anymore. <laughs> yeah. That's like such a cool concept because, you know, you're, there was actually an artistic piece to how you designed the thing, right? Um, mm-hmm. And like these days, I think there's a lot of cool art as well. Like mid journey is a popular model people use to like create art, but I guess it's like a different, this is like your, your thing sounds like more like actual art that I would see in a museum, you know, like there's like a deep concept behind it, which is pretty cool. Yeah. I don't, a deep or cheesy, I, mean, I don't know, but there cool. is a concept no, behind it's a, it. It's pretty cool. <laughs> I'm surprised I would, I'd pay to see that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's awesome. Yeah. It seems like there are a bunch of different ways that you can learn about machine learning. And if you are good enough at it, you'll eventually work at Databricks as a software engineer. Um, But I was wondering if you guys had sort of advice for any of our listeners on side projects or just things of interest that they can do outside of work to improve their machine learning skills. And ideally, it's not like build Facebook with like an open tool. It would be like uh, something more specific to ideally your guys' interests. Okay, I I, I can go first on that. So... I think the advice I give all people is that they should just work on something that they actually feel passionate about, right? Um, so for me, like that for a long time was computer vision. I think people should be solving constrained problems. I mean, you can obviously like focus on solving things like um, virtual reality or something, right? If you want to, but that's pretty hard. Um, so for me, like I try out all the new like models that come out on a regular basis. Um, that's fun for me. So like, for example, um, there's all this stuff around AI art these days, which is like interesting to just see how the models are operating. Um, so I know some folks who work in that space as well. And, and if you go and like, you can pull an open source model, like run it yourself uh, on a GPU or something like that, it's, it's actually pretty fun to do. And, and you learn a lot about what the tooling infrastructure looks like. You learn a, a lot about how the models, like they're, they're weird idiosyncrasies and things like that. And it's just fun to, uh, to go like say, like, hey, give me a bunch of faces of yourself and like, did you, you can, just see the, the new version something. that dropped the fifth gen of uh, it's insane. It is. Uh, yeah. If you give it the correct prompts, uh, it's really challenging provided that you don't have, you tell it like, Hey, don't try to render human hands. But if you tell it not to do that, it's really hard to tell the difference between um, like an actual image of somebody. It's the resolution is, it's yeah, it's more photorealistic. It's more photorealistic, right? But speaking to like the earlier point, like there are art is probably a little bit more than photorealism. So um, that that's another angle. But yeah, see, like the hands thing, like you would probably wouldn't know that unless you'd actually like spent some good amount of time trying out these models and being like, wow, these are weird hands. The thing that really blew me away was uh, <laughs> I had chat GPT 3.5 in one window and then an auto gen you know, image generator open in another window. And I was basically asking 
because I don't know that much about art. I was like, hey, can you tell me some some uh, like top three random artists from the past five centuries? And of course, ChatGPT 3.5, you know, starts pumping out a list of names. I'm like, I've never heard of most of these people. I've heard of a couple of them. But then you go into the image generator and you could say, hey, could you just generate this, you know, something funny that would make me sort of giggle to myself in the style of this this artist and then look it up online like some of the other works and it's it's crazy how well it it sort of makes those it, you know has that that sort of attention pattern association with you know what it's seen before and what's in its actual data set to be able to generate something that to a lay person you wouldn't be able to tell if you of course the things that i was telling it to generate people would be like what the heck why is by somebody holding a banana to their ear. Like, that's really ridiculous. But if you were to say, hey, create this thing in this style, like, hey, it's a landscape artist. Well, I want, you know, south of France, I want a river and mountains in the background or something. And it'll do that. And then you look at the author's body of work, and you're like, they've never, they've never even been to France. They've never painted that. But you can't really tell the difference unless you're an expert. Yeah. Have you guys seen art that's compelling that yeah. is generated by exactly. a machine? So there was actually an, an exhibit in uh, San Francisco um, in like dog patch or something <clears throat> that I went to um, where yeah. people actually like very seriously tried to make art uh, that was AI generated. And it was quite compelling. Like it was quite cool. Like because what, what people do, right, is by tuning the, the seed, you can actually tune the generation and, and then create like a GIF of like, you create an image, you can evolve it into another image. And you can just do that forever because the models are so good. So you, you kind of get this like multimodal art, which is some, you know, starts with some beautiful image and then it just evolves, for example, throughout seasons and throughout like to some other uh, location. And, and you can kind of just keep staring at it for as long as you feel like, because it, it keeps going forever. Like you... You don't maybe even it maybe it's not it's unique constantly as well. It doesn't just repeat. Got it. Yeah, there was a really cool exhibit at the New York MoMA where they didn't actually have AI generated art, but they leveraged AI concepts in the art. So they would make a neural network structure for some model very pretty. And I think they had some actual Google models in there that were like visualizations of an actual neural network that Google serves. Uh, so yeah, there's there's lots of cool stuff that's that's being developed out there. Um, but I also sort of wanted to shift gears a little bit. We've been talking about side projects, and uh, you guys have built up your skills both through side projects, school, and prior jobs. So I was wondering, and Ben, for you as well, uh, what do you guys think makes a good software engineer specifically for the machine learning world? I mean, I'll I'll take a first pass at that. Um, following on from what Ankit said, it's all about how much can you learn, how quickly can you learn it, and how much can you sort of collaborate and work together with the other brilliant people that are around you. And if you have those three cornerstones, like if you can learn quickly and you're not afraid to fail and you work well with others and listen more than speaking, uh, you're going to be successful in a, in a high functioning team. And you're going to learn way more than you're prepared, than you even thought you're capable of learning, I, I would say. That's Databricks Engineering, everyone. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> what are your, your thoughts, the two of you? I mean, you said it really well. <laughs> so it's kind of hard to top it. But um, yeah, I guess like specifically for skilled, let's say, I think, you know, it's soft, it's really just core software engineering. But I think it does help to have this context around machine learning, right? Having the experience of working with machine learning so you understand what's lacking in tooling, like Ankit mentioned. Um, and, you know, what are the use cases? Like you have a feel for it. I think that is helpful. It's not required like to build an ML platform, but I think it is very useful. Um, that said, you know, we don't, 
build products that way, right? We talk to a ton of customers and we understand what they need, but it does give you a bit more intuition, I think, to think about how somebody would use use what we build. Yeah, yeah, to build on that, right? Like that, that point around intuition is really critical. And I think in machine learning, it's really, really hard to get intuition unless you're willing to get your hands dirty, right? Um, it, if you, had it, you just gotta go try things um, and, and really understand what's going on. If I had to isolate two things, like for software engineer, engineering in a machine learning world, I'd say like the number one thing, as with all software engineering, actually be a, like a good high level uh, design thinker, because the the big picture is changing so often that if you're like too locked in on a particular vision, uh, sometimes you you might miss the bigger picture changing around you. And and I think yeah, you know, the second thing is being willing to just go really really deep and uh, and build quickly. Um, it, like, you know, like what, uh, what the folks did with, with serving V1, right? Like put something out there, see whether it works, If it works, then build fast and towards it. So Got it. Okay. And I'd say those two things. Sorry, go ahead, Ben. I just add one final thing that wraps up everything that the three of us said, which is something that I don't think a lot of people realize happens in the ultra high level, high tech software companies that are out there which is egoless work. And that's something that's super critical, particularly people that are coming from something other than like if they interned in college, interned during grad school in sort of these fang companies. And that's the, the way that those companies operate and the way that people that are writing software operate. It's part of how it's evolved over the decades. But if you come from an outside position into that, there's a lot of people that write code out there that they have an idea locked in their head of like, Hey, I have this grand idea. This is going to work. And if somebody comes in and suggests, you know, something different or changes, they almost take it as a personal attack. Or if they write code, they have almost an emotional connection to it. They're like, I built this thing and it's so, it's very important to me, but you never see that in, like within Databricks engineering, like usually people are more than happy to delete their own code and they're like, Hey, I can trim off 40% of this. Yes. I want to do that right now. There's less code to maintain, <laughs> less tested, investigate it. It's just less complexity. So it's good. You know, everybody loves those PRs when you're like, you just deleted 12,000 lines of code and like people are throwing a party for that person. Um, yeah, I was about to say that too. Like, we can't wait to get rid of V1 code. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there's certain things where you're like, hey, nobody's really using this. Let's pull the data. Like, can we just delete this entire module? Like, this sucks. Or it's like, it's flaky. It breaks all the time and nobody really uses it. So there's not that emotional ego-based connection to anything that people build. It's more, what I notice is it's more of an emotional connection from a sort of a technical, almost spirituality, you know, based group of people that are like, Hey, I really rely on these people that I work with. And I think they're amazing. And then if you talk to those people and they're like, Oh yeah, I think that person's really amazing too. So everybody just has this, this level of respect among peers and they trust one another. And there's no, there's not ego involved of like, Hey, how could you say that on my I review, do, you know, document, like, why would you attack me like that? There's none of that. It's usually like, Hey, thanks for pointing that out. That's a great idea. That makes this better. And I learned something today. So it, I think that attitude serves people pretty well as well. Yeah. I guess if, we, if you had to sum it up, it's like intellectual humility, right? Which is very, it's very easy to be humble yes. when everyone around you. Is so, and so, so like that, the more, you know, so, the more you yeah. realize you don't know. So it, Regardless of the the level of somebody's hubris and ego, if you're put into one of these teams, you, you're going to realize, you're going to just instantly feel, I don't know, at least I do. It's like, man, I'm the dumbest person here. This is crazy. And I've asked other software engineers and they're like, yeah, I feel like I'm underwater. Like everybody else is smarter than me. I'm, I think you're smarter than a you know, ton of people. So it's like, a, it's almost like a communal feeling that people have like that. Just like, man, everybody's a genius. I feel so dumb. But then everybody almost says that they feel it that way. Wait, let me, let me just roll it back to a point that I'm still stuck on. So it sounds like you guys are cold blooded assassins that just remove code at will. And you actually don't care about what you're building. 
it's all about the community. I mean, if people care about yeah. what they're yeah. building, yeah. yeah. But yeah. you want something that's maintainable. And if you can trim the fat, yes. We care about the product we're yes. building, right? Like we, we care about the end thing. So if we can make it better, we don't care about the old things that are slowing it down or making it worse. That's, I think. It's like relentless focus on improvement, right? If you're focusing on improving, you shouldn't be caring about like, oh, well, my code. Yes. There's, there's no real your code. It's, it's our product. And even so. if you come up with this, you know, like really clever implementation, I think people get away from thinking about their implementations like that. Sometimes, it, you know, sometimes you write something and you're like, huh, that was kind of, that was neat how that got solved or this is like really efficient. But nobody's, I mean, like most people that are writing code at the frequency and the volume that we do, it's, I don't know about either of you two, but I can't even remember what I wrote three months ago. Like, what PRs it like, even if it was like the super clever thing, I don't even remember. It's just like, Hey, I'm focused on the, what we need to do this sprint and next sprint in this quarter. And yeah, so it's a paradigm shift, I think. Yeah. I don't remember what I wrote last week and probably like two weeks from now, I'll come back to it and be like, what, why, why did I do this? No, so. I remember what you wrote last week. There's some really good PRs in the open source MO flow. It's awesome stuff, man. So are you guys proud of any of your prior projects or yeah. are they just wiped from memory? What's a prior project you're most proud of, Suan? I'm definitely yeah. so proud yeah. of the prior projects. I don't know I'm most proud of. Um, I have... Sh shredding I do kids' have, like, artwork. I, okay, yeah, I, I'm pretty proud of that one. But <laughs> I, I think I have some emotional attachment, for example, to model registry. Not to the code, like whatever. <laughs> but... Um, it's a little bit of a a, a, a baby, you know. It's, it's, yeah, I, I, yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I think I think because yeah. I feel like we like we built a really good model registry. It was very popular. I think it's actually better than pretty much anything out there. Like people started copying it. Like that's I feel like you know, and it was really really useful. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. it established a category. It like really established that category. It wasn't a word people used yeah, until, so until that. I'm pretty out. proud of that. Uh, yeah, I guess I also wrote the PRD for it, which was like my dark days of PMing a, a long time ago. <laughs> so. Maybe, Wait a minute. Yeah. You guys don't write your own PRDs anymore? I mean, we do, but I was actually like officially the machine learning PM for like a year. Right. A really long time ago. Um, but you're a dual had it then, right? Yeah, but I think I spent more time doing the PM work than engineering. And then I was like, I really need to build stuff. <laughs> I, can't, I can't just like write Google Docs all day. <laughs> it's killing me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, like people write PRDs all the time these days too, right? As engineers. Uh, I just didn't want that to be my only job. Right. Yeah. So speaking of the earlier point though, like I think like, Previous projects, you're happy to get rid of them, but you're proud of them in the context that they came out, right? Um, because like at that point in time, it was important. Uh, at this point in time, you get to evolve it into something new because it was successful and now there's people who use it and you can do it better. So it's like, you always want to get better, but like in the context of that time, I'm super proud of the work we did on model registry for sure. Got it. So the takeaway is if you need mindfulness and meditation and presence, you can just be a software engineer. <laughs> Noted. I mean, it kind of changes the way that you think about things in general, I think, like working in these, these teams is people, exactly as both of you said, you're focused on the end goal of what your, what the fruits of your labor do. You're producing code that tells the computer to do a set of instructions that create some, some product feature, but everybody's focused on how do we make the best thing possible? that makes our company the most amount of money, but more importantly, makes our customers happiest. Like, hey, how do we solve this difficult problem for people? I think that's across the entire department, at least, that's the one motivating thing that everybody shares in common. It's like, hey, we want to build cool things. We don't care like how we build it. That's irrelevant. And that might change. That might iterate a dozen times in a year. 
about, hey, we have to refactor all this. We have to change this. We need to build these new features. We need to drop these old ones that nobody cares about. But at the end of the day, everybody's focused on how do we delight our customers to the point where they're like, hey, model registry is awesome. I would never want to use a platform that doesn't have this baked into it. I've heard people say exactly that about like, hey, we're sticking with ML on Databricks because we have this registry. I've heard big customers say that. It's like their number one favorite thing about like ML flow. They're like, yeah, tracking's cool and everything, but but the fact that we know what's running in production and we know we have versions associated with it, that's like, man, that's really cool. Uh, to and everybody, that's what delights people. I think that are working on things is to hear that and realize we're doing that for these not just one or two people. We're doing this for thousands of people. And by the way, that's like a yeah. super unique thing you get to do at Databricks. Like I, I have a lot of friends in software engineering, right? Most people don't get to go talk to customers, um, but we get to do that all the time. And I think that is by far the most rewarding thing that I get to do. Is like hear customers say nice things and mostly not nice things, right? Because mostly when you're on the call, they're like, hey, we love this, but... We would love this more. Um, and, and that's also awesome because it means that they care enough to yeah, tell you I was you just that. about to say something similar to that is I think everybody loves the negative feedback more because it's almost like a challenge. It's like, hey, now we have something really cool to focus on that's going to be really challenging to build and let's scope it but but and do a design doc around it. But that whole process is just exciting. Yeah, because 99% of things just are born and then go away, right? Like products and software. And if someone is giving you feedback, that means they're using it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, do you guys have any negative things to say about Databricks Software Engineering? Because all, all of you guys have worked a variety mm -hmm. of prior jobs. So are there some, maybe negative is the wrong word, but cultural differences from those prior jobs that are, are notable? Are there cultural differences that are notable? Yeah, uh, thousands, but they're all in Databricks' favor. It's not like, oh, I wish that Databricks was like this old company that I was at. I've never thought or said that. I have. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I used to work at Facebook when it, was, when it was Facebook, right? And like move fast and like not break things, whatever, <laughs> was real. Uh, I think they're probably a little slower now. I'm not sure, actually. I haven't, haven't been there right, in like six years. But um, I do think, at least at that time, when I came to the Airbricks, I felt that, you know, we don't move as fast. But there's there's a reason. It's because we build, right? It's, it's more B2B, like we build for the customer. Like you need to build the right thing. Um, whereas I think... At Facebook, it was more like a lot of consumer features. It was very, very like experimentation based. You would just build out features really fast and see what sticks. Um, so I think I miss that, but you know, I I think I'm now more used to right like trying to build that right thing for the customer. Yeah, I, I would say something along the same lines. Like, uh, and the example I'll use is, is Apple. Like, I think when I was there you really get a sense of just a really, really, really strong and relentless focus on perfection and, and beauty, like building a beautiful product that is just out of the box, the best experience. Um, and everyone there is culturally aligned around that. And it honestly feels awesome when you ship something and at their conference, WWDC, you see it on the screen and it looks beautiful. There is a real satisfaction in that, which you just don't get to do as much in B2B software, right? Because like Suan said, you got to get that. You got to get out the door, get it to people. Um, if it has a little bit of a rough edge around, you know, the corner here, a little bit something there, it might be okay, right? Because you're, you're focused on really delivering business value. Um, so I, I do miss sometimes like that, like really, really sharp focus on on perfection and shooting the moon on a vision. Um, but I think you get to do that over a broader period of time. So what do you think is the biggest difference between? A company that focuses on that business value with respect to a product being released, even for like the, the initial GA release of something. If you're a B2B software company where you're like, hey, we're kind of focusing on the back end 
functionality here. So how would you differentiate that when you have a commodity product that's going to consumers with respect to fit and function and form and like how things look? What I'll tell you is that like at Apple, people can work on things for six, seven, eight years and only then see it come out. Um, and, and by the way, you can't talk to anyone about it that whole time. So uh, we, you just can't do that here, right? Like you have to ship it faster. Like eight years from now, like some other company is going to be doing, uh, you know, competing, out competing you in like one day, right? So you got to you gotta just get stuff out um, quickly when you're, when you're a competitive space and you don't but have I time I think where you do maybe. have to be more perfect is stability and security. Those are like super, super important, which is my, why, you know, the UI yes. may look a little bit janky here and there, but that's what we focused on, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Security is the Yeah, it's because it's a data I platform. And, I mean, yeah. And plus the, the stability aspects, yeah. we've, we've danced around, you know, the, the topic a little bit on the podcast so far about what, what this V2 serving really is. And it's enabling companies to have trust in a managed platform that, you know, you don't put models out there to do art generation or to answer silly questions in the tone of some famous person in a chatbot. You put them out there to make your company money or to protect your business or to prevent fraud and theft. Uh, some of these use cases that are going to be running on this service they're so mission critical to some companies and some industries that if that goes down, you could be talking about like, hey, we're losing $10 million in sales a day, or we have $50 million in fraud that got through in a 72 hour period because this went down and it just was not serving predictions. So yeah, the back end part of like, hey, this actually has to work and all the time, that's it's super impressive what your team has built, in my opinion, and about how good that works, how well that works, and how people can have trust to, to do that. Okay, like, hey, it's safe and secure, but it just it's going to run. And it's going to serve predictions for your important use cases. So, well done. Yeah, I mean, what's funny is you said all the time, and that's like three words <laughs> and sounds super simple, but it's actually oh, yeah. like so much work <laughs> to get something like all the time. Yeah. We've had customers also tell us, you know, they're really glad they're not on call for this, right? <laughs> we are on call for that. So, yeah. All right. Well, I have one final question and it has two parts. Zooming out, what are you guys excited about in the model serving world? Not just at Databricks. And then second part, what are you guys excited about in the ML world? Okay. Um, uh, I think in the model serving world, we are like starting to finally see wide scale deployments of deep learning, um, making a really, really big impact in businesses. And model serving is actually the number one aspect of that, that is going to control how much business value those things actually are able to provide. You have to be able to serve those things really, really cost effectively uh, in order for them to create the impact in the world that they're going to, you know, that they're capable of creating. Um, so I think there's a really, really exciting opportunity in this space in the next three, four years to build awesome, highly performant products that are taking like the, the silicon that we have to the absolute maximum capacity. Um, and that's going to be like basically essential. Otherwise, you can't create business value with these things. And then, you know, like similar answer, if you take a step back, right? Look at machine learning more broadly. These models are getting pretty, pretty damn smart. So, uh, I think seeing the progress on that, seeing like how you can go and just train on like trillions of tokens of data and even this relatively smaller model, right, can can perform really, really effectively. That's awesome. Like you can run it on your phone, your laptop. You, there's like endless opportunity to create awesome new customer experiences with machine learning. Um, so I'm, I'm broadly excited about the language model and vision space in that. Yeah, Ankit said it so well. I don't know how much more I can add, but yeah, I'm really excited to see what people are going to do. Like people are going to do with these models. You know, I think we haven't even seen 
or <laughs> super cliche, but it's like tip of the iceberg. Like people are going to be super creative, I think. Yeah, I could harken back to my previous uh, career prior to getting into software. Uh, I'm really excited from on the serving front for the commoditization of GPU compute with AMD now focusing more away from HPC and into regular data center. So when their silicon gets into more data centers and they make they make the strides that they haven't been making over the past 10 years, which NVIDIA has exclusively been doing, but now they're doing it. The last you know, three, four years, they're like, hey, we're, we're going to start supporting consumers so that you, know, you can use these particular cards uh, and do deep learning with them. When that happens, it's going to do the same thing that the original, you know, GPU war, which was video game GPUs that happened 10 years ago, where NVIDIA got there first, the prices started creeping up higher and higher and higher for these cards. And then AMD was like, yeah, we got this too. Uh, but they can, they can undercut the price because AMD has their own foundries up in uh, upstate New York that, that pumps these things out. So that with foundry operation at AMD, the new GPU chipsets and TSMC lowering its operating costs when they're doing, you know, sub five nanometer GPU uh, lithography, we're going to see the cost of all of this go way down. You know, there's going to be more opportunities for the proliferation of this. And from the ML perspective, I can't wait for the next iterations of some of these deep learning models. Uh, I want to know what's after the transformers attention model. I want to know, I know that th there's a lot of research being done right now. A lot of universities are focusing on this, but I want to see what's going to be possible in the next three years where we can shrink to, to maintain the same capabilities as we have right now. We can shrink the size of a model by a hundred X and that, I mean, that's coming. It's inevitable, but I I'm looking forward to that day. Well said. All right. Well, I will summarize and wrap. So today we talked about model serving and a bunch of other random things per usual. Um, and starting off when thinking about model serving, there are a bunch of options. So you can use SageMaker, Azure ML, GCP Vertex, and Databricks model serving. Um, everybody here is biased on the call, so do your own research, but we like Databricks model serving. Um, and then when thinking about side projects to develop your skill set, whether it be for software or ML or software for ML, uh, it's often really, really helpful to work on stuff you're passionate about because getting something over the finish line that you don't care about is really, really hard. Uh, try it and you'll see. And also Ankit mentioned a really good point for focusing on constrained problems. Uh, so don't try to solve general AI unless you really, really want to. I try to focus on smaller niche things that you can actually tackle in, let's say, a month or so. And also getting your hands dirty to try the newest models. Uh, that leads to developing intuition, which is extremely valuable as a software engineer. Then some traits of good software engineers include learning fast, willingness to fail, and collaboration. And all of these sort of fall under the umbrella of extreme humility. Then from a product development standpoint, it's important to talk to customers and then also know the fundamentals of, of computer science so you can actually build what you intend to. So Suan and Ankit, if people want to learn more about model serving or you guys, where should they go? Reach out over email, LinkedIn, whatever you feel like. Uh, Ankit at Databricks. Happy to chat with anyone who has anything interesting to talk about machine Can't learning. Can't send an email to Ankit. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm still at Databricks, so same thing. Great. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Uh, until next time, it's been Michael Burke and my co-host. Ben Wilson. And have a good day, everyone. Take it easy. See you next time.